Hello and welcome to a brand new season of Connected. On our first show this year, retro gaming guru John Power drops in to talk about his massive classic arcade game collection. Our roving reporter Greg Hinksy Hinks has had to undergo some retraining for this series and we'll see how on track he is. And 612 ABC breakfast host Spencer Howson takes us to Fiji in the aftermath of severe tropical cyclone Winston. And musically, Brisbane singer-songwriter Erin Jane will give us a sneak preview of her new EP being released this month. It's time to get connected. <laughs> Can't believe they finally put one in the studio. We'll get no work out of the crew at all. But if you grew up in the 80s, you would most certainly be familiar with machines like this. Space Invaders, Pinballs and even Donkey Kong were arcade machines that entertained millions of Aussie kids. Well, believe it or not, there are still a few working machines like this one still around. And it's all thanks to our very own retro gaming guru, John Power. G'day Damien, how are you? Mate, welcome to Connected. Yeah, thank you so much. Good to see you. Uh, fantastic to have you. Yeah. And of course, all of these wonderful machines. Yep. Space Invaders, I'm guessing that mm. would have to be one of the oldest. Yes, it is. But you know, the oldest one I have is from 1972 called Pong. Okay, it's like the bat and ball game, you know, the old... Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And you sit at a table yep. and uh, made by Atari. That's right, so, and uh, yeah. even back on the old Commodore 64 computer. Yes, yes. Well before many people watching. You can remember that. That's good, good, good. <laughs> now, of course, uh, with these machines, I mean, yep. they come in different varieties and forms. Yes. With Space Invaders, though, that yep. was one of the big popular ones, wasn't it? It was the biggest hit in the 70s. Pretty much started the arcade boom off at the late 70s and took it right through to the 80s. Right, so, and big in Japan. It was so big in Japan that they actually ran out of coin. So all the Japanese are putting all their coins in, and they realised they had nothing left. So they had to quickly turn over the machines and empty them out quicker and uh, free up the coinage. Amazing. So, now, first game in history to do that. Come over here mm. because I know with uh, Space Invaders, yes. there's a trick to winning, isn't there? There is, but do I have to tell you? Yes, you do. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, now the trick to Space Invaders is... You've got to put your 20 cents in oh, first. Oh, 20 cents, yeah, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, when the game starts, yep. the aliens march across in formation from one side to the other. Right. And when they do that, they go down one position. So basically every position they go down is closer to game over. So when they come across, shoot them in straight lines before they hit the side, and that way they won't go down any further. Easy done. We'll yes. see how we go with practice later on. You need plenty of practice, I mate. do, I do. Yes. Now this one here, which is a, a tabletop game, isn't it? Yes, these were made uh, very popular in the late 70s, through about 1983. And uh, they feature classic games like Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, Frogger all those particular types of games. Mm. And the reason why they were replaced in 1983 because they had smaller upright cabinets that replaced these. Um, basically like the Space Invaders, but a lot smaller. Right. So you can fit two machines in for one of these. So these were quickly phased out in the early 80s. Now looking mm. around at these machines, John, yes. what sort of people buy or rent these machines from you? Uh, mum and dads that were kids in the 80s are now wanting these. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, businesses that want to hire them out for functions. Uh, I do a lot of jobs down the entertainment centre uh, for private functions for those. And of course um, some celebrity buyers too, you, you've uh, had yes, some, haven't yes, you? Yes, yes. Uh, shall I mention his name? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, one morning I had a, a phone call from a gentleman. He said, don't you answer emails? I said, yeah, I do. He said, I want to buy one of your tables, matey. And I said, oh, okay. And I didn't believe who he was. He said, I'm Carl. You know the Today Show? Carl Stefanovic. That's him. And yeah. I, I said, no, I don't really believe you. So he sent me a photo of himself. <laughs> and uh, you know what? He was so happy with the table, he bought one for the other presenter that was on the show. Uh, ben, ben Fordham. That's ben right. Fordham. Yeah, yeah, Ben Fordham's got one of our tables. So, and they like yeah. the classics? They love the classic games. All right. Yes. Now, of course, this one over here, and if you step over this side, yes. this is actually Star Trek. looks a bit more modern than the others. It is a bit more modern. And the reason for that is, in the last five years, pinball has hit a boom period again. Pinball was very popular in the 70s, mm -hmm. and then it got phased out because of the video game craze. Right. Now, people are playing less video games on location, and they want a pinball machine. Ah, mm. I see. So how many yes. machines in total would you have yep. stored under the house? 
We've got roughly about 80 and about 400 in our whole collection. Wow, yes. that is amazing. Your wife must love you. Oh, Melissa loves it. Every time I bring a, home, a new game home, she just asks me, what, what's next? What is it? <laughs> she's so curious about it. All right, now, in case she, mm. she's watching, what is next into the stable of uh, arcade 80s games? Okay, since we're going into the pinball and we're standing around one, yes. I haven't told her yet. The next pinball being released by Stern is called Ghostbusters. Ooh. Yes, and it's a very unique game because it's based on the old technology, but it's all flashy, and it's on the old cast, not the new movie that's coming out. So, there, so uh, Melissa, watch mm. out. Dan Aykroyd could be coming to your place very soon. Oh, he is, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and how much would a machine like that cost? Uh, generally, a pinball, like from Stern, new is about 8500 Wow, so it's yes. not a, a cheap hobby. No, but believe it or not, more pinballs are going into people's homes than what people operate them. Like operators like myself, where we put them in shops and places like that, um, not many of us doing it because they don't give a good return because yeah. everybody wants them for home. And of course you yeah. had some, some big hardships uh, back in 2011, like, like many in South East yeah. Queensland with the floods. We did. We lost 75% of our machines on location through Ipswich and the Lockyer Valley area. Well, yeah. you've built that collection back up nice and strong now, haven't you? We have, and the good thing about uh, running original picture tube screens in our tables and uprights and things, they went for a swim for four days, and pretty much after you pull them out of the water, hose them off, they all worked again. LCD screens don't cut it, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I've got one here, actually, that we prepared earlier. Uh, so this is actually a picture tube. That's right. It wasn't in the microwave, and it didn't shrink, folks. I didn't feel like bringing in a big-sized tube. So this is a demonstration of a picture tube. Uh, it's a sealed glass unit, and pretty much if you throw that in the pool and plug it back in again four days later, it still works. Wow, amazing. Absolutely. Technology's great. Mate, it's great. If people are interested, they can also check out your website, arcade80s.com.au. Yes, that's right. They can do too. I'm going to hand you that back. Oh, thanks, mate. I can't keep the crew at bay any longer, so guys, come in. And we're going to take a break after this. We'll have a lot more connected, so make sure you stay with us. Play a game. And welcome back to Connected on our brand new set. Well, once the workplace of over 3,000 railway workers, the Workshop Rail Museum in Ipswich now welcomes thousands of visitors each year. The workshops, as it's affectionately known, is steeped in history and was the birthplace of Queensland Rail, with the very first train departing the iconic yards over 145 years ago. We sent our very own roving reporter, Hinksy, to track down the story. Hi, I'm Hinksy, and I'm here at the Workshops Rail Museum at North Ipswich today. We're going to check out some of the history of rail in Queensland, and I'm going to see if I can learn how to drive a train. Chugga 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 Toot toot! So Geraldine, is this where I come to learn to be a train driver? Absolutely, you can come and take part in um, all sorts of things here. You can go on the uh, simulator for the diesel driver. You've got a simulator. You can, you can pretend <laughs> to be a diesel um, driver. You can even stick your um, hand out the window of the cab. This site here, the Railway Workshops, has been here for over a hundred years because I remember when I was in school coming here on an excursion. That wasn't a hundred years ago though, was it? That was, <laughs> feels like it sometimes, <laughs> but it was here. We got to have this amazing tour and it was still a working workshop at the time. It is actually still a working workshop. Is it really? The part of the workshops that are the museum, obviously, has now got a lot of displays in it, but behind the scenes there's a railway workshops that's still operating today, that's maintaining steam locomotives and carriages going forwards. If you want to ride in a steam train, because you can actually ride in them in different areas around South East Queensland, but one is Steam Train Sunday. Steam Train Sunday, you've got to love Steam Train Sunday. Um, you can find out about it on our website, but basically um, it's around about an hour, an hour and a half um, ride on a steam train around the suburbs of Brisbane. And you see some of the old stations, you get to experience the sound of the steam engine and also the grit in your eye. You can walk between carriages, it's a fantastic experience. Does the cart come down there where the lady you know, when you act like a muggle? No. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mm. So these these old lamps, they, these were actually used on the trains? Yeah, and signalmen would use them. And there are so many different types of railway lamps that uh, equate to different times in the history of the railways. And you've got all the, the, the smaller trains over here, the model trains as well. You wouldn't fit in one of those though. I should hope not. I probably could drive one of them, but the only thing I could drive. <laughs> So, have you had a good day at the workshop for our museum? Look, I've had a ball checking everything out. Look, am I qualified to drive anything yet? Well, I think I've got a train for you to drive. Spencer Housen, who was on the ground as aid arrived after Tropical Cyclone Winston. You're with Connected. And welcome back to Connected. Oh. On February 20 this year, severe tropical cyclone Winston slammed into the popular island community of Fiji. It was the strongest storm on record, a Category 5, with winds peaking up to 325 kilometres an hour. Winston inflicted extensive damage and killed 43 people. An estimated 24,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, and approximately 350,000 people, or roughly 40% of Fiji's population, were impacted by the storm. Immediately following, a coalition of international support brought tens of millions of dollars in aid and hundreds of tonnes of supplies to residents in Fiji. Among those on the ground in the stricken region was 612 ABC producer Bernadette Young and breakfast host Spencer Housen, who joins us on the program. How are you, Spencer? Hey, Damien. Good to see you. It's great to see you. What a fantastic effort the international community has been making. But how long after the, the storm hit did you guys get on the ground? We were there about a week and a half after Winston. So we got the call up. It was uh, exactly a week after. It was a Saturday morning and, and my boss rang and said, we want to do an appeal. I knew it was coming because we, yeah. we've done appeals for Vanuatu, for Nepal uh, and, and Pakistan, other places. And uh, the call came through, do you want to go to Fiji for the appeal day? And I just said, yep. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we, we have this shared community of interest with, with the South Pacific and to me it seemed a very natural thing. I, I couldn't say no to that opportunity. There was a, this, this storm took some uh, off guard, didn't it? I mean, uh, they weren't really prepared for it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, on, on, the one, on the one hand, the South Pacific is very prepared for severe weather. Um, the, the aid agencies have supplies pre-positioned, which is why the, the relief effort was so fast. Uh, but on the other hand, um, Coro Island, for example, which is uh, an island off the main island of, of Fiji, um, the, the tidal surge there, the three metre waves, communities there were just not prepared for. We, we heard of one bloke who essentially had to tread water for four hours. He was swept out to sea. Um, I spoke to a woman uh, on the main island, just near Raki Raki, up, up in the northeast of the main island of Fiji, whose community is literally on the beach. And when we were there a week and a half after, they were already rebuilding homes there. But she said, everything was, was swept out to sea. For us to see it on TV, it's a bit hard to appreciate or understand the level of destruction, uh, but thankfully you guys uh, took some uh, home video as well while you were there. Let's have a little look at this and it, it might bring it home to people. Yeah, sure. Well, we, we stayed in, in Suva in the south of the main island and it was fine. This is about three hours drive north or about 150 k's north. Uh, and this was the first time we saw uh, Raki Raki. This is a village where I'd say 50-50, if your house wasn't destroyed completely, it took a big hit. Every single house there um, took a hit and this is coming into the main township of Raki Raki where uh, the commercial buildings as you'll see uh, have done okay. They're, you know, they're pretty sound structures and so the day we were there there were a lot of people in town. No power, so a lot of generators just keeping the shops going but a week and a half on the servo there was was fully stocked with with food. There wasn't a problem uh, getting a, getting a meal. There's there's Bernie, my my trusty producer, and um, for the, for the two of us, first time actually sort of playing foreign correspondent. You know, <laughs> we're more used to to telling the story of what's going on in Brisbane. But as you can see, that now if you just tuned in, it kind of looks like a pretty normal 
uh, yeah. you know, it, CBD, if you like. But once we got to, not that, not that every building in the centre of, of this town was was uh, was fine, but mostly they were. But a lot of people in town that day who just sort of come in to access aid uh, or just to share their experiences with each other. Uh, as we drive out of the, the CBD, uh, then we were back into areas where houses were completely flattened. Um, mm. And then probably the, the most shocking thing we saw was um, a, a school that had completely lost its roof uh, and a four classroom block had been flattened. Uh, and this was a school where uh, they were convinced this, that this school was going to be fine. And so they had told the students to leave, leave their things in the classroom. They'll be fine. Yeah. And, and we got there and, uh, the, the, as I say, the roof had gone from the school and, and you just saw uh, schoolwork that had been drenched and uh, the, all the glass had smashed from the windows and all that glass was in between the schoolwork and there were clothes and, and it was just horrifying to see. And yeah. yet, the, the headmaster at that school was saying, we're going to start classes again on Monday. We don't know how. But we have to to get a bit more, get a bit of normalcy into the lives of the kids, and and to get mm. the kids out of home so the parents can start rebuilding yeah. their homes again. Obviously, the school sounds like that was the the one moment that really stood out to you. Oh, yeah, I, there were a couple. The, the school was definitely a, a big one. Um, uh, I, I mean, we we were driving past, we we looked over. There's this huge building, clearly a school or, or mm. similar in a very bad way and we drove in and this was what we just kept doing we we were we were not attached to any agency uh, even though the ABC partnered with the Red Cross but we we just hired a car in Suva and just drove and so um, as, as happened whenever we saw something amazing we just drove into the school grabbed the recorder walked around until we found people and the staff room all the staff were just sitting in there um, just still sort of in shock sort of saying all right what are we gonna do how yeah. are we gonna do that and the, the other I suppose big one was in, in that first village that we just saw before we drove into the main town, uh, a bloke who was... Um, see, this is on the other side of town again, and we might see the school coming up in a sec here. Um, a bloke who was just sitting under a tarpaulin, uh, he and his family of five, and, and he said, uh, this is where my house was two weeks ago, and, and now this is all I have, and the Red Cross had provided uh, some shelter, and you can see that you know the vegetation has been stripped. Obviously, Here, we're about to hit the school. You'll you'll see, uh, and you know, fires everywhere as well, burning. And here comes the school, which is that, Look at that, that. orange-looking building. Look at that. And they, there's a school that they thought was going to be fine. So they told the kids, yeah, leave stuff here. It'll be fine. And we yeah. just looked over and we just went, whoa! Look at that. You can just see. And how were the co the locals coping uh, on the ground while you were there? <sighs> I'd never been to Fiji before, but I'd heard plenty of stories about how uh, how friendly and welcoming Fijians are, mm. and I, I can't believe just how positive they were. They were so optimistic, so positive, and I I said to one of the blokes who was just sort of standing around on the street, "But how how come you got a smile on your face? Like, are you are you?" I asked him, "Are you happy with the speed of the aid getting through?" And he said, "It's all happening in Fiji time. Things happen a little bit slowly here, but we're really happy that it's happening in Fiji time." Um, mm. So, you know, they've been through this before, nothing of this scale. This was unprecedented yeah. in, its, in its severity, but um, they knew help was getting to them and um, they were positive. You know, like the headmaster, we'll do something, we'll get, we'll get classes started on Monday. Mm. And I'm looking around the school going, you, you kid, there's the school again. You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> And, and I'm sure they will. And UNICEF, there's the bloke with his family. There you go. How's that for a... He had a house two weeks ago, and that's where he and his family... And you can see in the background, that's the same house. You can see in the background his, uh, his washing machine and his fridge. No power. Yeah. But, um, and this is, this is the, the community right on the beachfront where the woman said, yeah, everything just sort of washed out to, to see. And you look a bit further on, it looks post, uh, postcard picturesque, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Beautiful. The, the road from, from Suva to Raki Raki, uh, a, a number of times Bernie and I said this, would be an, this will be an amazing road to come yeah. back and, and spend a holiday driving yeah. this road. And then you would just hit devastation like that around the corner. Mate, I really appreciate you coming in and telling us about this story. It's a wonderful effort and of course they need so much more help, don't they? Oh yes, the, yeah. the Red Cross and other agencies and they're all working with each other. This is what really impressed us, to make sure there's no duplication. So if, the, if you don't want to support the Red Cross who, who supply shelter, uh, support UNICEF who supply water. Mm. Or, or support Save the Children who are helping with the schools. So find an agency. Um, you can go to abc.net.au slash appeals and all the agencies are listed there yeah. and they definitely need 
our help. I think we have a responsibility as we sort do. of the, the big brother or big sister to help them out. Well, we thank you for yeah. highlighting the plight of uh, Fiji at the moment right. and uh, appreciate it and listen to you on uh, ABC. And if you'd like to find out how you can support the people of Fiji, visit redcross.org.au. Indie rap darling Sneaky Picnic created a bang at the Big Day Out recently and they shone a bright light on lead singer Erin Jane. Her first solo EP, Masquerade Heart, is due for release this month. Please welcome Erin Jane and Miss Me. Miss Me, fantastic song, and that just about wraps it up uh, for us today. However, if you'd like information on Erin, check her out on Facebook, Erin Jane, and have all the details of her EP launch. From all of us in the Connected team, thanks for your company, and until next week, it's bye for now.